We're, we have a beautiful dinner that's going to be lined up, but before that, we have something uh, really special, and um, this is something that I feel has been missing a little bit from our event, which I'm glad that we're pulling together, and that's to, uh, and I think it's appropriate that we have this discussion now, and it's like, because what we're doing, what you're all doing really matters, right? We're trying to raise capital. We're doing all these things, but why? We're doing it because we're, we are trying to advance healthcare. We're trying to help patients, and um, I don't think we get enough bedside kind of discussion. We get, get enough discussion from the uh, clinical side about why what we're doing really matters. So tonight it's an honor uh, for me to bring up somebody who I have a tremendous amount of respect for. And this is a cardiac surgeon who is affiliated with Stanford, Mayo, Johns Hopkins, and is at the Medical College of Wisconsin. That's, uh, before I bring him up, this is Dr. David Joyce. And uh, come on up, David, if you can. Uh, Dr. Joyce uh, is... Um, not only an incredible uh, physician, but he's also um, a technology, he has a, a, an incredible mind in, in, with reference to technology. And so uh, what I challenged him to do here over the course of the last two and a half days was to observe, to take things in, and to maybe give us some observations uh, at the end of this. So this is like a very much fluid, on the fly, a real-time perspective from somebody out, that's out there helping patients every day and is very connected to tell us, maybe make some observations about what he saw. And then after that, we're going to bring up uh, Dr. Manny Villafana and we can talk about his view and his history and we'll tie it all together. This is the grand finale. I'm so happy that you're all here. Let's uh, take this all in. If we have time, we'll do some questions and then we'll get after it with uh, the reception and, and uh, a nice dinner. So thank you very much, Dr. Joyce. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Yeah. And thanks, thanks to the whole LSI team for what has just been an incredible uh, couple of days here. Um, well, I want to start my comments from, uh, not from the medicine side, but actually from the first question that I was asked on the first hour of the first day of an executive MBA program that I did at the University of Chicago. And the question they asked was, what is the purpose of the firm? And of course, this is the Chicago School, so we went straight to Milton Freeman, 1970, the purpose of the value, uh, the, the purpose of the firm is to maximize shareholder value. And so pretty much everything that we learned in the next two years was kind of focused on that, and obviously that's extremely important. But nowadays, I think we're seeing, um, th there's, there's sort of this movement that maybe it needs to be a little something more than that. Maybe, maybe the benefits that we create for society, no matter what industry you're in, maybe that's something that we should be focused on. And maybe the, the shareholder value follows as a result of that. You see, you hear this a lot in the, in the media now, and, and there's, you know, a lot of companies that are really focused on this in different ways. And, and certainly we can all think of examples where you can create a lot of shareholder value. I mean, the tobacco industry created a lot of shareholder value, and I'm sure everybody in here knows someone who suffered from lung cancer or emphysema or heart disease on the way to delivering that value to shareholders. I mean, there's less extreme examples. I think even, even some of the next negative externalities that... Uh, that come out of maybe the automobile industry from pollution and things like that. These are all things that, on the way to creating shareholder value, there's not necessarily the immediate linkage with value to society. But what every single company that I listen to at this, at this event and every single one of you in here, no matter what your role is within the ecosystem, every single one of you inherently is focused on the most important value that there is to society, which is creating higher quality of life and, and longer quality life for patients. There's just, I don't know that there's anything that a person can commit their life to that's more important than that. And so I think that's, uh, you know, as a physician, that's kind of the, the thing that really hit me about this meeting was just looking at the, the enormous uh, ecosystem that's behind that push. And of course, as a physician, I can only move as fast as the entrepreneurs can take me. I'm, I'm, I, I love to try new products. I love to push the envelope on new treatments, but we're at the mercy of how fast this machine can move. The other thing that makes it a little bit tricky, though, is that healthcare is incredibly complex. The health system is totally complex. So even something as simple as, you know, we just connected everything to the patient. The patient uh, experience is really, uh, I think, the end game for all of us. And yet, when we try to define the customer in healthcare, this was another shocker that came out of business school one day, was that it, actually the patient is not the customer. 
the in a lot of the, in a lot of the devices and a lot of the things that we work on a lot of times it's a provider it's the person rendering the tr treatment to the patient so already we get disconnected and of course that person most of the time is not paying for the technology there's a different system in place where there's you know, purchasing departments and administrators at the at the health system that have to decide which of these treatments are available and which ones are not so it's very easy i think to get disconnected from the uh, the benefits that we're creating from for patients, just given how complicated the whole ecosystem is in healthcare. Um, one of the things that I think really stood out to me was um, Antoine Papirnik the other night talked about his experience with core valve, and I found this fascinating because here he was really doing the exact thing that you should always do in a in a decision about an investment or a new technology, and that's go go talk to the customer about what they think about this product. And he did, he did the right thing. He talked to all the cardiac surgeons. He had great contacts, really good advisors. And they all said, no, nope, we don't need that. That's, you know, that's, uh, we're, we're doing pretty well with these big open heart procedures. And we're, we've got these great valves like the one that uh, Manny Villafana has given us. The two, the two major valves that Manny Villafana has given us, we don't, need a, we don't need a transcatheter product. And yet, uh, there were a lot of patients that actually did need that because it turns out there was a whole, we thought the pie was this big, but once we had a way to send people home in 24 hours with basically the same uh, uh, risk with, with much less invasiveness, all of a sudden we could expand that to even uh, older patients, sicker patients. And my, uh, my grandmother almost made it to 100 this year and, and managed to go for an extra three or four years with one of these transcatheter valves that she got in her 90s. So a patient like that would have never even been considered for, for uh, intervention in the, in the previous era. And, and again, this is just what makes it complicated, is that there, you, know, you can even do the right thing, talk to the customer. And, and I think the other thing that, um, that really stood out to me is I'm, I'm kind of what people would call mid-career. So that means I've been around long enough to see basically every single treatment that we offer change radically since I was in training. I mean, basically nothing that I do right now is, with, with maybe one exception that I'll mention in a minute, it's, it's a totally different world than the one I trained in. Uh, but at the same time, I come to a conference like this, and, and I see what the future looks like. And it's incredible. I mean, some of these things just seem too amazing to be possible. It just seems like there's no way we can actually get to that. And But when I look back, I realize that, you know, we're it's not even a question. We're definitely going to get there. Uh, the case, case in point would be my, my chairman, who honestly was one of my most important mentors at Johns Hopkins. Um, he was he was a little bit anti cardiac surgery. So when I when I told him I wanted to go into that, he said, you know, you're going to be one of the best trained cab drivers in the entire country. And of course, that was before Uber. So I don't know if that you know that turned out not to be true on a couple different levels. But um, another thing that he said, we had a grand rounds one time on um, very early Da Vinci robot, and uh, the, one of the surgeons got up and presented all these beautiful cases, videos, and things that were being done. And at the end, he got up and he said, you know, that looks like an operation that's waiting for an indication. Well, I learned yesterday that 19 million times last year that there was a patient that turned out there was an indication for that type of technology. And we saw multiple examples of that here. But, you know, as much as we're focused on artificial intelligence and wearables and all these exciting new technologies, it's interesting that there's still a lot of, of very, very straightforward problems that haven't even been solved yet. The operation that is the most commonly performed operation in the United States is a coronary artery bypass. And uh, this has been our, well over 50 years that we've been doing high volumes of this operation. We've tried a few things. Some of them have sort of worked, but really the operation that I do when I bypass a patient is basically identical in terms of the technology we're using as, as back in the, in the 1950s. Um, and so there's a need there. I mean, we, we definitely have a need for uh, better tools and, and things just like what we saw in the world of transcatheter valves that we can kind of advance this field uh, you know, across the horizon. Um, but at, at this point, there hasn't been much traction. However, uh, I want to I want to bring up and introduce you uh, to Manny Villafana. You all know him, obviously, but uh, Manny uh, 
is is such a legend. I, I wanted to try to think of a sports analogy of somebody who's, uh, I mean, seven IPOs, what's the sports analogy for that? Well, maybe it was Lance Armstrong and the Tour de France, but he cheated, so that doesn't work. I mean, you just can't, you can't come up with another example of somebody who has uh, been as successful, uh, created as much value for share, shareholders, and most importantly, saved as many lives with his efforts as Manny Villafana. So um, I'd like to bring him up here, and we're just going to have a little bit of a chat, um, uh, just some some history of, of uh, his career and what he's accomplished, but also uh, I'd like to hear a little more about Medical 21. So I'd like to start, anytime you're talking about a legend, it's always, it's always hard to know where to start the story. I mean, do you, do you go all the way back to the beginning? Do you kind of hit the, the, the high points and work backwards? It's always a challenge. I'm going to arbitrarily pick a very specific time that I want to talk to you about when, when things kind of really got going in what we now recognize as ground zero for MedTech Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I want to talk about the day that you met with Earl Bakken and talked about uh, the possibility of coming to work at Medtronic. And when we think about Medtronic now, we, this is a company that's based in Ireland. They well over $30 billion in revenue, 100,000 employees. Is, what was it like, what was it like when, when that conversation took place? Hi. First of all, again, I'll join uh, David in saying thank you to everyone here. Um, to Scott and his staff. Maricella is one of my favorite ladies. I call her Saint Maricella, okay? Not because of all the things she does, but she has to work with, with Scott, okay? <laughs> anyway, going way back to ancient history here, um, I got a call from the Secretary of Earl Bakken, who was the founder, co-founder of Medtronic. And at the time, I was working for a little entity out of, out of uh, Picker X-Ray called Picker International. And we were representing many small little companies to export their product from the United States to England and Europe and the rest of the world. And... Um, and I was working with a little thing called a pacemaker, just starting out. And um, so after working a few years exporting this product, we finally got it started. So I get a call from, from Billy Saucier, and she says, uh, Manny, can you pick up Earl at the airport? He's coming into New York. And... Um, and take him up to White Plains where the company was, where Picker International was. Sure, not a problem. Came with one of his uh, new vice presidents, a guy named Charlie Cudahy. So I take him and uh, finally get him into a hotel room, and that was a separate story. And, uh, and I'll pick up tomorrow morning. I'll take it to the office. And they said, Manny, aren't you interested in why we want to talk to you. I said, no, you want me to take you to pick it? No, no, no. We're here to hire you. We want you to join us. And here's a little company that has 75 employees. It's a company that has never made a penny. Okay. It was already, at the time I'm talking to him, it was already 17, 18 year old company. Think about that. This is the great Medtronic and still not making a penny. Had gone through two bankruptcies and, and I joined them. Well, did you talk salary? No. Contract? No. Why not? I said, I was given the opportunity to get out of the South Bronx. That's where I was born and raised. And anybody who's lived anywhere near that area knows that if you can get out of the South Bronx, you're going to get out of the South Bronx. And that's how it started. Years later, it was interesting that a guy named Bill George, who was a, one of the former presidents, again, of Medtronic, 
was introducing, just talking to a gentleman and looking at me, pointing at me and saying, and here's a guy that started Medtronic. And I went directly to the guy and I said, no, he's full of, you know what? I didn't start Medtronic. And Bill George, who was a very distinguished president, really made some major changes in Medtronic, said, Manny, you're wrong. Before you came on board, we could never make a penny. We didn't know how to sell. And of course, we had zero knowledge of the international marketplace. Medtronic got started when you joined us. Anyway, that's the beginning. So I, I find it ironic, having grown up in Minnesota, that getting out of the Bronx and heading to the frozen tundra of, of Minneapolis <laughs> was, was, a, was an upgrade, but, but I, I, I see what you're saying. So, okay, so you're at Medtronic, and you're, you're, you're doing sales down in, in South America, and, and right. you're, you're watching these early pacemakers go in, and, and the next thing you think about is, um, you know, we need, we need some better tech. The, yeah, well... It, First of all, I, I ended up living in South America in Buenos Aires, Argentina for a couple of years for Medtronic. And I was one of the early people that made it a point that you go into the OR to teach. We had to teach how to do pacemakers. We, we, this was so early that, what do you, what's this? That's a catheter. What do we do with that? We got to go down to the, the jurgler, et cetera, et cetera, to get into the heart. And you had to teach that right in the OR. Now move over. Let me have the let me have the the catheter, okay? But it was amazing how they were starting to fail so early. I mean, the average pacemaker only used to last twelve to eighteen months, and I was in places where it was lasting even far less than that. So over the there was a period of time there when we had so many failures that I call up Earl Bakken from South America and he says, Manny. You better come up here. So I, I flew up, and he showed me a chart. It wasn't that you went to a computer. There was no computer. He had laid out a very big, a very big paper chart, okay, with numbers. And this is our problem, man. These are failing. This group, that group is failing, and stuff like that. And it was the old mercury zinc batteries that, you know, just had a, a failure rate. And this particular time, it was even greater than ever before. So. At one point, I said, you know, what are we going to do? And he says, we're, we're trying our best. When I got back to the office, my secretary told me, Manny, we have so many doctors calling us and patients that I finally figured out. I called back and I said, I want 43 pacemakers. Don't ask me how I came up with 43. Why not 50? Why not 40? 43 pacemakers, I remember the number. How are we going to get them in? Remember, South America, or at least in Argentina, to get any product through customs, it took two weeks. I didn't have two weeks' time. So I called the two largest implanting doctors. I called uh, their uh, secretaries, or, or I'm, I'm sorry, one was a scrub nurse, and another, and then my secretary, and there was one, two, three, five of us. We went, and I said, I call Earl. Earl, I want 43 pacemakers right away. We arranged it to pick them up in Miami, and we were trying to figure out how we we're going to get these things in. Right before I got on the airplane, one guy came up. It was Dr. Dussault, Alexander Dussault. And he gave me a, cho a, a jacket, not a jacket, a coat, a raincoat, normal raincoat. It was dark blue, except this one had 16 pockets. <laughs> it was used for smuggling, okay? And um, so we met as a group and said, we're getting on the plane, we're going to this hotel. It was, it was like a big modern hotel. It had four big buildings, I remember. And we walked into this room. And in the corner of the room is a big pile of boxes with 43 pacemakers. To make a long story short, we were taking them out. We were putting them in our pockets. Uh, I remember 
we all agree that, you know, we get rid of the boxes and all the paperwork. You don't need that. We're just getting the pacemakers in, in the sterile pack. Uh, I remember uh, the girls were putting in their in their pants and their bras and everything. You know, I mean, it was really unbelievable. And I'm envisioning this better work or, or else you will never see me again, okay? They will not throw the key away. They will burn the key. They will melt the key or, or something. So anyway, we finally got back, and as I'm getting off the plane, and we all separated, we were on two planes coming back so that if any one of us got caught, at least half would get through. And we're doing this just to try to help a patient. There was no money benefit. There was nothing, okay? But by law, I suppose we were smuggling, <laughs> something like that. So we got in. As I get off the plane, and I, for some reason, I was one of the first ones off the plane. And in those days, the plane was you know, parked outside, and then you walk down these stairs. And right at the bottom of the stairs, there were two guys wearing the, the trench coats. You know, if, if, if you ever watch uh, Casablanca, <laughs> you know, uh, Humphrey Bogart was always wearing this trench coat. They were exactly the same kind of trench coats. Okay. Now, I was, I was hesitating how many people went, and I said five, and I remember is because the sixth person I wanted to go was our rep, the representative, a guy named Caivano. I said, now, you're going to join? He said, no, 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 senor, I'm not going to join you. And I got really angry at him. I said, what? We're going to take the risk? I mean, at the end of the day, you're the one who's going to get the pacemakers, you know, and we're going to save the market for you and all that sort of stuff. No, senor. I'm better here than you going. I said, okay. So when I get off the plane and I'm walking down, these two guys, and the one says, Senor Villafaña. Yes, sir. He pulls out this beautiful gold, blaring gold badge. Says aduanas, which in Spanish means, you know, uh, customs. Okay? Treasury Department, going to jail kind of badge, you know? <laughs> okay. So he takes me, he says, is this all you have? I said, yes, sir. You know, I didn't, have, didn't check any bags or anything. This is all I had, a little attache case. So follow us. And as I'm walking through, I see my secretary and I see Dr. Dussault going through customs. And... My secretary starts talking about to the to the uh, agent there. Oh, young man, how are you? Hi, John. Hi, Joe. Flirting with the guy, so she, he wouldn't look into her, into the bags, and she got through. And Doctor Doctor uh, Dussault had another problem, but there I was, oh, kind of sweating bullets, you know. And he walks me right out, and he says, "Welcome to Buenos Aires." What happened? Now, out of the corner of my eye, I see Caivano. And Caivano blinks his eye. Gotcha. He stayed behind, and he bought a whole big can of grease, and he greased everything <laughs> necessary for me to slide through. <laughs> so I, I think, if I remember right, I think Jordan Belfort should have credited you in his book, The Wolf of Wall Street, on those tactics because I think they're, you know, that, that is an incredible story. Um, so so but, now... But, but, but let me just say, at that point, it became very evident. We had to change the way yes. we were making pacemakers. Uh, and when I got back from Argentina, I went to Earl and, and to the staff members. Said, Guys, we got to do it a different way. Uh, and I had become informed of... a a technology using, believe it or not, lithium batteries, not for the car, but, but with the initial concept of being putting it into a medical device. And and it was presented to Medtronic, and they said, nah, it'll never work. Okay? I took the idea, and I went to them, being on the inside of Medtronic, and I said, come on, guys, we got to do it this way. And they said, no, it'll never work. And at that point, I said, well, I'm going to pursue it. I did. I had a badge on my, you know, Medtronic badge on, on my shirt lapel. 
and and the president of the company at the time, which was no longer Earl Bakken, walked me out the door, walked me down to the, uh, we took the elevator down to the first floor, and at the reception desk, he pulled the badge off, gave it to the, uh, recess, uh, the receptionist, and walked me to the front door, out the door. Because I told him I was going to do it. And he knew that, he wanted me out of the building before any of the other employees would join me and things like that. So that's, that's how the lithium power pacemaker started. I started to work with a, a guy named Bill Greatbatch who had developed a new type of battery. And I said to him, here's the deal. If you promise never to make a pacemaker, I promise never to make a battery. We shook hands, no lawyers, no paperwork. He went off to start a company called WGL, which became a multi-billion dollar company. And I started a little company called CPI, which became Guiden, is now Boston, and another multi-billion dollar company. And that's how the lithium pacemaker began. So lithium pacemakers radically changed the entire field. CPI is growing by leaps and bounds. You're, you're now in the process of building a brand new million square foot facility to keep right. up with production because right. the, the, the entire field, and particularly at CPI, is, is uh, getting big fast. Right. Um, now, at that point, uh, did that just seem like a good time to disrupt a completely different area <laughs> of cardiovascular, or how did, yeah, how did we go from that? I had that? nothing to do and couldn't fall <laughs> just asleep, kind of you know. <laughs> No, we were doing um, the lithium pacemaker, and our biggest challenge was that we how to make enough of them. At, at, the, at a point, at one point, we had already gone from 5,000 square feet, which is where I start companies, and within a period of about two years, we were already outgrowing 150,000 square feet. Okay, uh, the, the, we were. Open seven days a week, 24 hours a day. The lights never went off. And we were trying to make enough of these pacemakers. And when all of a sudden, one of our customers, or well, two of our customers, a guy named Dr. Parsonette in Newark, New Jersey, and Dr. Nikoloff in Minneapolis, said, Manny, you've done a good job on pacers, but what we really need is a heart valve. Now, honest to God, I didn't know what a heart valve was. I mean, I knew what it was, but I, I mean, I knew nothing about heart valves. I couldn't even name the four valves in your heart. And uh, so I went to the guys and I said, hey, guys, uh, Nikoloff wants us to make a valve, CPI make a valve. And I clearly remember, clearly remember when I proposed it to the other guys. He said, what are you talking about, Manny? We don't even have enough time to take a piss around here, you know? And, and I said, well, look, I've done my thing. I mean, one of the things you, you got to know about Manny is I don't get my jollies watching a company go from five employees to 50 to 100 to 1,000 to 5,000. That's not my thing. My thing is to create, do things that people say can't be done, and make them successful and get them into humans. I mean, that's, all, that's my job. Okay, and so I said, well, guys, I think I like to go after this. And we were emptying out one building, going across the highway where we were building, literally at the end of the day, a million square feet. If you go now and see where Boston Scientific is and CPI and all that, that's about a million square feet. Okay, and I said, I want to do it. And so I left the company and started a little company called St. Jude Medical in one of the buildings that we were abandoning as we built the new buildings. And that company, again, grew even faster than CPI at a, in a technology that people say, Manny, you're crazy. My, my, one of my very, very good friends was an a electrophysiologist, a cardiologist, David Freeberg, he says, you are not going to do that, Manny. And he's a good friend of mine. I said, why can't I do that? He said, Manny, all you will end up with is you will have a, 
a valvular patient and you will end up with an artificial valvular patient. Valves were so bad. The most common valve at the time was a, a thing called a ball, uh, ball and cage valve, the Star Edwards valve, made by a company that we know today as, as uh, Edwards. Okay, That was the most common valve. And I remember early, early on, I took the St. Jude valve to visit a doctor in Paris where in, in France, everything was a Star Edwards valve. I don't know, for some reason, virtually everything was that. And he said, you want me to put this in a patient? And it, we, at the time, we only had maybe 10, 20 implants in the whole world. I said, yeah. He says, do you realize if I put this into a young lady, the, uh, you know, if we have a little problem, her face will become distorted. Her tongue will probably hang out of her head. Might go blind. And if we are lucky, she will die. At this time, my rep, who's never handled a, a valve before, and me, I got 20 valves under my belt, okay? We were all like peeing in our pants. I mean, we just were scared. Of, how do you answer that question? What are we getting ourselves into by handling valves? And the only thing I could say to the doctor was, <clears throat> that's right, I want you to use this. Because if you don't use it, we will continue to see young ladies with their faces distorted, going blind. And as you said, doctor, if we're lucky, they're dying. Because at that time, the thromboembolic rate of a ball and cage valve was about 6% per year, which means if they survive the first year without a stroke, the second year, their chances are 12% and 18%, okay? And the following day, the doctor put in a St. Jude valve because he, like all of us, the entrepreneurs in this room, we have to take the risk and do the first step. Otherwise, nothing will happen. So I, I can remember, I'm, my, my father is a, is a cardiac surgeon with me in Wisconsin and also uh, part of the, the Medical 21 board. And um, I can remember, I think I was in training, but I remember going to one of the big cardiac surgery meetings with him. And uh, St. Jude had, had, was celebrating their, their millionth implant with, uh, with no structural deterioration. And I just remember him putting his arm around me and saying, can you believe that? I mean, a million of these things. Yeah. And they have yet to have one single failure. Yeah. Structural failure. We do occasionally. Structural failure, up right, and, you know, right. Stuff like yeah. that, occasionally. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, it continued. And, of course, today, as we take a look at history, we're talking about four or five million patients walking around at St. Jude. Um, by the way, the, the pacemaker, the CPI pacemaker, just CPI, not other pacemakers, just CPI. We have over 10 million patients wow. on that one. Wow. So of, of all the products, I mean, the, the St. Jude valve was every med tech company's dream. I mean, what, what was the market share at the time that you got the idea that maybe this would be a fun field to disrupt and, and, and bring in and, and compete with this juggernaut that you created? How, tell, tell us a little bit about that. Well... So, so you're talking about how it, to improve? Yeah, 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 exactly. So we, we go from St. Jude, which is basically now a company that is unbeatable in the in the valve market. Right. I mean, this is this is the Coca Cola with no other. There's no <laughs> competition, and and we used uh, to call it the Oreo cookie. Yeah. How do you compete against Oreo cookies? Well, it turns out that there there was room for improvement, and uh, and there was a need from a group of guys who said. Manny, you got to get back into the valve business. And I said, what are you talking about? And I've been there, done that, you know. And uh, they showed me. They brought me the data that occasionally a St. Jude valve will clog up and stuff like that. And there was a better way of maybe we can make it better. And one of the things that I, I saw personally was that it took time to implant the St. Jude valve. 
it's you got to be careful that you don't put the sutures around the ears if if you know what, what I'm talking about when I talk about that. So we decided to do another company called ATS Medical, and and the, the biggest challenge was you know, we always have a challenge. How do you get into the market? And this, the biggest challenge was how do you compete? How do you compete against Oreo cookies? In our country, in the U.S., Oreo cookies own the cookie market, okay? Oreo cookies with a glass of milk cannot beat it. Forget about it, okay? <laughs> so how do you compete against Oreo cookies? And again, it was a case of teaching, educating, and we were able to do it, okay? We improved on it. We made it a little bit easier to implant. The T rate was lowered even further as we opened up the pivot, and uh, and we were able to improve it. And then Medtronic came along quite early, much earlier than what you would see these days, and took us out. Okay, and but when I left the company, we had about 23 percent of the market. Yeah. Okay, and my personal goal on anything I do, if I don't hit a 20 percent of the market. I consider myself a failure. So I, I want to add a little bit of an anecdote to the ATS story because no doubt the tech was better. It was, a, like you say, the best valve on the market still is. Uh, but but there there's so much more that was going. I mean, there there are so many clever things that you guys were doing. And, and uh, you know, as a surgeon, the one that, that I always think about is, so valves uh, up until the ATS were all sized on odd numbers. So most patients have... You know, probably the average would be a 23 millimeter annulus, where the the circle where the valve sits in is 23 millimeters, uh, and they go from 19 to about you know 29 basically. 33. Oh yeah, depending on the de depending on the the position you're going to put it yeah. in the heart. Um, so um, every single valve on the market is odd numbered. And of course, when we're, when we're getting ready to sew the valve in, the, one of the things we always ask the person doing the echo for the case, the anesthesiologist usually is, you know, can you measure the annulus for me? Because I just want to get an idea of what we're dealing with here. Maybe I need to enlarge it. You know, what, what, what do we got? And so the, the, the game that the anesthesiologist learned to play, because they knew that as soon as they said, that's a 21, we're going to say, ah, got a 23, and I guess you are uh, maybe need to go back to the, you know, there's a little bit of a rivalry between the, you know, across the blood-brain barrier, as they say. Uh, so the anesthesiologist got smart, and they started giving us even numbers. So, so ah, that's a 20, you know. So, the, so then you basically, you know, you can't really talk too much trash because, you know, if it was a 21, you know, what are you going to do? But ATS decided to use even numbers for the valve. So even even those little things that, you know, obviously, uh, you know, as, as a surgeon, you know, your your anesthesiologist tells you, oh, this is a this is a 22. I mean, that that's a that's a nudge that you're not even thinking about. And it's just, and it's amazing to me to think about all those uh, all the all the things that went into that company. Yeah, the the key thing is for all of the entrepreneurs here. If you're working with surgeons, there are a lot of thumbs out there, okay? There's a lot of thumbs. Remember, when a doctor goes to school, some are graded A, I got a B, a C. If they get an F, they don't graduate. But you have all of these in the range. And there are some surgeons that really, ah, you got to hold their hand a lot. And so uh, one of the things that I said in making the ATS valve is I want to make it as easy as possible to make this valve implantable. And I bring that up only because the work that we're doing now in the field of bypass surgery, I said to my engineers as we started, I want to design a product in which every surgeon would not have to make one change. If I have a thousand surgeons here, believe me, there's about a thousand different ways of implanting a graft on the heart, taking a vein, putting it on the heart. Some cut it a certain way, another way, a third way, a thousand ways. And I said, I don't care which way he or she wants to cut that vein. I want our graft. He can cut it any way he or she wants to cut it. You got to do those things when you're thinking about your product. Is the ultimate user, and little things like 
which way is he, he going to cut it? Yeah, and I, on that note, I think this is a this is an appropriate time to to talk a little bit about Medical 21. So now that uh, the heart rhythm uh, field has been uh, has has been pioneered, we've we've gone from that to structural heart. This, I mean, talk to us a little bit about the total addressable market of ischemic disease and coronary artery bypass relative to the other companies that you've done. Just to help us understand the scale of what's different about medical Well, first of all, when we started St. Jude, let me go back for a second, and when we started St. Jude, the world market was about 65,000 valves, and we know what happened from there. When we started CPI and the pacemaker, the pacemaker was only about 70, 75,000 pacemakers per year worldwide. Well, we're gonna talk at about doing cardiac surgery, trying to eliminate the harvesting of vessels out of your legs, out of your arms, off your chest, and putting them, putting an artificial graft. The addressable market right now, just for the cardiac area, just for the heart, is between two and a half and three and a half million grafts. This will be the single biggest product ever developed for implantation in the body. I'm not saying there's not other things that are big. This is big, okay? You can take all the pacemakers, all the heart valves, all of the fibrillators. Remember, we also made a defibrillator, okay? And this is bigger than all those three combined. So that's how big it is. And we have to make it in such a way that it's user-friendly, but the goal is to eliminate the harvesting of vessels, and we're doing that. We hope that within the next two months, um, around November, that we could start doing some human implants. Um, we're very excited about it. From here, I go to Switzerland. And there are four different centers waiting for me to give them all the data because they all want to start. I've never had a, a, a product in which there was so much interest to get started right away. Okay? Um, I don't know what else to tell you. It's well, a big, I, big market. It's a well, $10 billion I, market. Here's a question. I, I kind of I feel like you kind of left out a, a little bit of, I mean, I want to hear a little more about your, your strategy because I, we use the saphenous vein for a lot of different things in surgery. We got peripheral bypass, we got dialysis access. I can think of about 10 things outside of this part of the anatomy right here where a nice medical 21 graph might be very handy. So how did you talk, talk, to, talk about the business strategy with, you know, why, why, why go right after cabbage and, 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 and only cabbage as your, as your first beachhead in this whole game? Well, uh, come on, let's, let's be honest here. I went to my guys the other day and I said, when can we make a thousand graphs in one day. They looked at me kind of silly and said, well, what do you mean by, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Well, I said, well, we got to get there real fast because a thousand grass per day only represent 10% of the market. If you want to do some math, all right, if we sell them, let's say it's between three and a half and three and a half thousand or five, $5,000, let's just use 5,000 as an easy number to operate on. That means that we're selling $5 million a day, which if you multiply by 300 business days, okay, so you're at a billion and a half per year and only representing 10% of the market, okay? Now, I don't know about you, I don't know if you're God, I'm not God, I can't think numbers that big. I can't, I can't even figure out how we're going to make a thousand per day. Never mind that if you start using this device in peripheral areas and renal areas and and dialysis and pediatrics and things like that, which it can be used because the way our graph is designed, it can be used in any one of those areas. Okay, I can't handle that number right now. So when I talk about numbers, I'm only talking about the heart. I'm sure. Somebody will come along, take us out, and say, we're going to do it in other places. Good luck, you know. It can be done. I mean, I've already been approached by 
by vascular surgeons who have said to me, Manny, if you give us this, we will do more than you do on the heart. The reason we don't do more is you're already taking them out for patients, you know. But now if you give us this, we can do even more. So even by using peripheral alone, we'll probably double that market. But it's just too big. Let's just talk about the heart. I feel very comfortable with the heart. I don't have to go any bigger than that right now. So you mentioned the team, and I think um, I think it's remarkable that uh, nobody has been able to demonstrate long-term patency of any prosthetic conduit in a in an animal, and and yet this team has has developed and modified and succeeded in uh, how how many animals. We have done ballpark. We have done uh, somewhere around ninety-five to one hundred and five animals, uh, but but you know we it isn't all one design. It's it's different iterations. Ah, that's not working. Start all over. Uh, you know we start. We have fourteen iterations, and I said to somebody the other day. Hey, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. Don't spit that out, you know, when we say 14 iterations. Wow, well, fine. you know, that's been a waste of time. No. When I was doing St. Jude Valve, I went to the back, uh, back, the back part of the office and to our machine shop. And in our machine shop, there was a guy named Charlie, Hos Charlie Hosley, a heavy set kind of guy, big belly, and he had he was wearing a, a leather apron, and he was the machinist, and he was crying. I said, "What's wrong, Charlie?" He said, "Manny, do you realize this is the twenty-six iteration of the Saint Jude valve? In other words, we had tried twenty-six different designs and modifications to come up with the Saint Jude valve." So when my guys were getting a little nervous, Manny, that we'd done 10 on this, 11, and we thought for sure we had it at 13, and we showed our data to our advisors, and I could see looking in the eye, mm, well, Manny, I said, shh, on to 14. So we are in the 14th iteration. We have animals now that are way out there, we're approaching one year. In, in fact, <laughs> I'm going to talk, talk about him. He and his father implanted one of our grafts in an animal, and usually we implant it to the LAD, the Widowmaker of the Heart. But that particular animal, the LAD, was embedded in the heart, so they could only use a small OM, a small vessel, small diameter vessel. And they said... Both he and his father came out of the OR and said, well, Manny, I'm sorry we couldn't do it on the LAD. We found a small little OM. We would never do this in a human. It's too small. It all failed. And we hooked up the, the graph to that. And, and I don't know if it was you or your father said, yeah, it probably lasts only 24 to 48 hours. Okay, so we first looked at that. We did an angiogram on 56 days, and I went called him up and I said, gee, I don't want to call you guys a liar, but this sucker is still working at 56 days. Well, we recently destroyed the animal, opened it up at 320 days, okay, and we cut it open and the graph was gone. The artificial graph that we had developed was gone. The way we designed this graph is that we make it from a certain type of polymer, a multitude of polymers, and then we wrap it or uh, with a nitinol wire, okay, and then we implant it, and through a period of time, the polymer is absorbed into the body and is replaced by the human endothelial cells, creating a brand new graph for the patient a graft that's being created by the patient's own cells. It was gone. All was left was an endothelial graft made by the patient, strengthened 
by the nitinal wire, that will stay in the patient for the rest of his life or her life. Okay? It's stronger than any other vessel in your body. That's what we have done. So not surprisingly, um, this product has gained a lot of traction and a lot of interest from investors. And, and um, I, I want, you know, obviously funding is, is going to be an important part. I mean, we, as we go down the list of things that we, that we think matter in a startup, obviously it's an incredibly novel, brilliant idea that, uh, for this graft. Uh, nobody's ever done anything like that before. We've got a great team with an entrepreneur that's done seven IPOs, so that you know that sounds good. We've got a product that I can say as a surgeon, I've as you said, I've 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 played with it, and I think even if I did have ten thumbs, I could have probably managed to do it. You know, it, it just makes your life easier. It takes an hour and a half out of your operating time because you're not sitting around waiting for that vein to come out of the leg. Um, so uh, clearly, there's there's going to be an interest in terms of investment. And uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about kind of the recent news that we got um, on, on the, the individual investor and then maybe a little bit also about uh, the Reg A. And maybe not everybody in here knows exactly what is involved in that. So maybe kind of talk through that a little bit. Well, mainly for the entrepreneurs that are here looking and having the exact same problem, creating something, how do I finance it and things like that. Uh, over the years, we have been very fortunate in being able to do financing through individuals and eventually an IPO. Right now, uh, since we ended up working on a product, a technology that took a long, long time, and you know, we started the seventh year on, on September uh, 16th was our seventh year, or been in six years, now we're on to our seventh year. Um, you, we don't have any revenues yet, okay? Uh, and you kind of start, you can't do an IPL these days without revenue. It's, it's very, very difficult. I won't say it's impossible, it's very difficult. So Scott, who has been working on reggae financing and this new law and stuff like that, said, Manny, why don't we give it a try, okay? It would be phenomenal to be looking at Here's Medical 21, where the 21 represents the 21st century. Why don't we do this, a 21st century type of financing to finance this company? And through the team that Scott has put together, we're doing a financing that allows both the accredited and non-accredited investor to participate in what we are trying to do, which is new technology to help patients. And there are a lot of people out there that will say, I'm gonna do it, not because I might make money on it, but I'm helping something, and particularly since grandma had bypass surgery and she struggled, okay, or my uncle is gonna have it tomorrow, you know, if we can do these things better, why don't we do it and why don't we make an investment in this? So that's how we have been financing. Um, Recently, we announced that, uh, again, through Scott's help, we were able to find uh, an individual who was willing uh, to put in, uh, make a commitment to us for $20 million, which takes us a long way while we are still doing the reggae. The reggae is something unlike a IPO where you, you identify your, your financing and you get it done and your, your check is paid to you three days after you go, you go effective with a reggae, it takes time as the money comes in. And that's about the only difference. Um, and you can reach both the accredited and non-accredited investor. Well, great. I'm I'm going to go ahead and open up to the rest of the group here. I know um, I, the, I have no question that a lot of people would like to get some questions answered and hear more stories. So, uh, rather than than continue the the dialogue here, why don't I why don't I just uh, if you guys want to raise if anybody has a question they want to ask or something they want to follow up on, just raise your hand and I'll come bring you the mic. A silly question, whatever. You ever wonder yep. why? Come on, there's got to be something like that. Okay. Yes. Were you, all, were you all wearing the same color raincoat? No, no. It was a blue raincoat that I had. The other guys did not have raincoats. And, and, and one doctor went on a different flight so he, he wouldn't get caught with all of us. And, um, yeah. 
You know, I don't tell that story too often because there might be <laughs> an agent from Argentina here. We've been following you for all these years. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for all your time. And again, Scott, thank you for a great meeting and bringing us all together. If you ever have any questions, grab me somewhere. And, uh, and, and thank you, David, for, for doing this. Thank you, Manny. Great stories.